very much, Mangeshi. And uh, thank you all for uh, being here. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to have this opportunity to tell you something about some of the problems I'm interested in. So I'm going to uh, talk about the problem of obtaining uh, LP estimates for uh, so-called spectrum multipliers of sub Laplacians. So the question is about uh, understanding uh, LP boundedness of uh, uh, operators, which are in the functional calculus of functions of a certain operator, which in certain settings replaces, uh, so takes the role of the Laplacian, the Laplace operator. So just to motivate very briefly what I'm going to talk about, let me just mention that, uh, well, for example, if one starts from a harmonic analysis or a Euclidean harmonic analysis perspective, one might be interested in studying, for example, properties of uh, Fourier multipliers. So on RD, these would be operators S of this form. And, and so uh, these are operations one might be interested in uh, studying. And of course, I mean, if one restricts the radial Fourier multipliers, I might just write something of that kind. So and let me just point out that this kind of operator can be reinterpreted as a function. Of the, of the Laplacian, or if you prefer the square root of the Laplacian, given the model size, the symbol, the Fourier transform of the square root of the Laplacian. So somehow the study of radial Fourier multipliers, which include a number of things, I don't know, both of its means, and so other operators which might have a certain kind of interest in harmonic analysis, can actually be written in terms of functions of, of the Laplacian. And similarly, of course, functions of the Laplacian can be used in order to describe solutions to a number of differential equations associated with the Laplacian itself. You think of the heat propagator. Wait. Propagator. Which I will normally think of the sign family associated with the square root. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. So, okay. So, we have our formula right. Anyway, so what I want to say is that, of course, we have also other objects which can, can be written in terms of functions of the Laplace operator. And indeed, what one might be interested in is uh, understanding, uh, for example, boundedness properties of this operator of certain spaces, including LP spaces where possible, which may lead them to information on the regularity of solutions of the associated regression. Now, these problems, of course, in RN uh, can be studied with a number of tools, including indeed the Fourier transform that gives us either explicit formula or uh, more concrete ways to get estimates for these kinds of operators, but of course, uh, one might also be interested in going beyond the Euclidean case and studying, for example, certain PDs in context other than RD, where the role of the Laplacian, I mean, is taken by a different operator, certain think of the Laplace spectrum operator on a Riemannian manifold or other settings of that kind, and then one might be interested in studying similar questions about boundedness of operators in the functional calculus of a more general uh, operator rather than Laplacian, uh, but without having all the tools that come from standard Fourier, uh, Fourier uh, analysis on Euclidean space. So, so that is the, somehow the general setup in which the topic I'm going to talk about today is going to be uh, sort of part of. And what I'm actually going to talk about is the problem of obtaining these kinds of estimates when uh, uh, at least the properties of, of functions of the uh, plus line, the plus line operator, when we replace the 
Laplacian with the sum of Laplacian L on the sub Riemannian So, sub Laplacian uh, in general is a sum of squares of vector fields of this kind of matters, bracket generating condition, potentially with, uh, say, lower order terms. And I mean, uh, in this generality, we have the problem, I mean, may become a bit complicated. Uh, so what I'm actually going to do today is to speak, and actually also in the following uh, lectures, to speak to a particular case, which somehow uh, is the local model for the sub Laplacians I'm going to talk about. So if you think of a more general second order elliptic operator on a manifold, you freeze the coefficients and you look at the principal part, you get back to the start of Laplacian. So in some sense, when you study the Laplacian on LD, you can think of doing some sort of the local theory for more general second order elliptic operators. And what I'm going to do is to try to understand, first of all, the case of the natural local model for this uh, sub Laplacian, so sub Riemannian manifolds, and these local models are actually so called homogeneous left invariant sub Laplacian or stratified groups, because by certain uh, sort of cons uh, contraction approximation arguments, one can show that effectively one can well approximate a more general uh, sub Laplacian such a, an object, which, as I mentioned, is this kind of uh, homogeneous left invariant sub Laplacian. And this somehow has the main advantage that gives us uh, some sort of, for example, translation invariant with respect to a like, group law, so more complicated than just uh, RD, especially because the group law may be and will be non commutative, and also some homogeneity, which also will be convenient. Okay, so let me just then try and state the main. Properties. So today, I mainly try to introduce the language I'm going then to use in the following discussion. <laughs> so we're going to talk about uh, homogeneous subplatations of stratified groups. So let me start by taking G to be a stratified group, which means we have a connected. And simply connected important group with the algebra is stratified. So, what do I mean by that? The meaning is that. We take the Lie algebra, so a real finite dimensional Lie algebra, and we assume it to be a direct sum of a finite number of subspaces, which we call layers of the Lie algebra, so the GJ and the J layer, with some properties. Meaning that in the Lie algebra is a vector space, the R, and we also have a Lie bracket with the appropriate properties. And what we assume is that this uh, sort of uh, the composition, the Arisan decomposition, has actually a gradation. So the Lie bracket behaves well with respect to this, uh, this, this decomposition into layers. In particular, to take the bracket of G1 and Gj, we get. Gj plus one, and here, when I get to the top layer, what I mean is that uh, if I do G1, Gs, I will get zero, so J is zero, J is an S. And so not only do I want this to be a containment, this would give us somehow uh, at least part of the condition of this being a gradation, but actually one quality means that actually if I start with G1 and I take iterate the bracket, I actually get the whole the after. So in particular, the first layer 
generates the average. Okay, so that's the assumption on the the algebra, and then the, this is number here, the number of layers that we have here is called the step. So this is equal to S step the algebra. If S is equal to one, effectively this means that you one and you one to zero. And so we are just in the abelian situation, it's just as if we were working in RD, but otherwise we have a complicated non-commutable structure. And then uh, because G is important, Indeed, because we take iterative brightness at the point of zero, and the group G is simply connected by assumption. This actually implies that the group exponential now from the algebra to the group is actually a little more physical. So, we actually have a, a natural way of putting coordinates on the group by using just linear somehow coordinates in the in the Liage. Okay, so these are called sometimes exponential coordinates. So we can effectively identify our group G with its algebra as a map. So we're not really working particularly fancy manifolds, it's just a linear space, RD, but the point is that we have an algebraic structure which is not just that of the, uh, that of RD, we have a non-commutative structure. And now, if we now take the product law, well, you see, uh, in general, on a general group, one can show that Actually, there is an analytic structure, and one can write down the group operations of the power series in exponential coordinates. And it turns out that this is given by a development which is called the baker campbell alstor formula, so the power series involving iterated commutators of the elements you are multiplying, up to this identification of the group and the algebra. And as it turns out, because this is important, then this Baker Captain also formula truncates at a certain point, and so you only get a finite number of terms. So it's given by uh, a, the truncation of the Baker Captain also So we can have something like the product of two elements, x and y, will be given by. First terms in the way can count the point always the just the sum, and then you have additional terms, such as the commutator, the the bracket of x and y, and then you might have other terms like y y, and then you will have some in principle some other terms that are not. Going to write, but as you see, you get iterated commutators. So at a certain point, this trunk is if you're working in a two step situation, this just disappears. If you have three steps, you need to take this, and you might have additional there. Okay, so we have this, and in particular, this tells us that effectively we are working on a linear space or D in some sense with a polynomial because all these terms are you know, this is a bit by linear form, by linear map. And so actually, if you write everything in linear coordinates, this just becomes a polynomial to flow in terms of the components of X and Y. So uh, an interesting consequence of this beta campbell alstor formula of the truncation thereof, and somehow related with the potency of the algebra of the group, is the fact that the left and right translations that to say unimportant different what I mean by that is that if say I want to think of black translations by an element x so it picks x and I think of y as a variable so nothing from g to g the group to the group 
then what is happening here is that if I do the differential of this mapping, this polynomial mapping, I only have to take the linear terms in Y, so I will get this one, and then I have to maybe throw away a few of these commutators, keep on the ones which are linear in Y, and as it turns out, apart from this one, which of course, if you do the, this just in the identity, because it gives you Y, the rest, is giving you iterative commutators. And because of the importance, you can just think that if you do the differential and write it in coordinates, you have one on the diagonal coming from this identity, and the rest is just upper or lower. So according to, to how you chose the coordinates. So because of this importance, effectively, this tells us in particular that uh, uh, this uh, mapping preserved the back measure. So actually, the back measure is invariant under left and right translations. So the bag medical D and the Lie algebra is actually a left and right on the group. So the hard measure, in this case, it's the same as the right, so the measure invariant on the left, and in this case, also right translation, is simply the back measure and exponential group. So from many points of view, this very much looks like RD. The reference measure is the same, it's the back measure. Uh, it's really just that we are using this kind of non-commutative group law, which may somehow be different. The other thing I mentioned that is somehow important for them, is uh, the homogeneity structure. So not only do we have translations here, we also have dilations. So the natural dilations are what are called automorphic dilations are given by the following formula. And if you take an element X in the Lie group, so you can identify it with the of the Lie algebra, and then split it into the components corresponding to the various layers. Then we define the dilation of such an element by parameter t is just multiplying each component by the appropriate power of the dilation parameter. Okay. And as it turns out, again, one can check it, for example, by using the, the formula I mentioned, or anyway. So then these mappings are automorphisms. of the Lie algebra structure because of this bracket condition. So it means that it can do the dilation of the bracket of two elements with respect the dilated elements. And similarly, it is an automorphism of the group structure if you identify the group and the algebra with the exponential. So these, again, are quite natural objects to work with. And then we have a convolution. So we are in a group. And so it makes sense to take convolution of functions, which is not the standard convolution in RD, but is the one associated with the uh, group structure. So we can write the convolution of two nicely behaved functions like this. So you can just write it properly. Okay. And here, of course, in preparation with respect to the R measure. So here, instead of x minus y, it's not b, you have x one minus y. Let me point out that from this kind of expression for the group law, you can also show that actually the group inverse of an element is just minus 
uh, the element in the linear coding is given by the exponential map, and the identity element of the group is just zero. So somehow, also these things are similar to what you would expect from from this stratified setting. And so this is a formula that works for nicely behaved function. Of course, you can generalize it to different settings, even distributions with uh, the appropriate assumptions on those. And uh, some important tools that we have here, which are analogous to what you have on a D, are Gans convolution. So one cannot prove essentially the same inequality that you know on Nadi, PQ, RP, only to my given to the nation. Not that here. Constant okay, not zero. That's the optimal one. That's a different issue. Uh, and another important somehow tool that, that is related with the convolution structure, or at least combining the convolution structure with more general results, uh, which is the Schwarz kind of theorem, we can also say that. Any operator, linear operator, which is bounded from, say, Schwarz class functions to distributions. Here, when I speak of Schwarz class function on the group, I just think of it as again as a linear space with an exponential coordinate. So it makes sense to speak of the Schwarz class and then I do add it to contemporary distribution. So any linear bounded operator from Schwarz class to uh, the temperate distribution, which is left invariant, which means that it commutes with left translations, can be written as a convolution. Correct. Meaning that a right convolution operator has a right convolution kernel, and it, you can write it. Like this, where in general this kernel will only be a distribution, a temporary distribution in this setting, but depending on the situation, you might be able to show that it is a standard property that I just there. So the Schwarz kernel theorem in general would ensure without this left invariance assumption that there is an integral kernel, distributional integral kernel in two variables. And the fact that this operator is left in value allows one to show that this two variable distribution actually only depends on one variable in some sense. So this is not a difficult uh, thing to, to check. Except somehow a similar argument will work uh, also in this in these three groups. Okay. So now we have said something about the uh, the group and the convolution structure we have at our disposal. So what I would like now to mention is is something about the subplot So just to introduce the main object of study. So for that, it is convenient to introduce, first of all, uh, left invariant vector fields. So, what I'm doing is, well, recalling the fact that one way of thinking of the Lee algebra group is really 
as the Liangelo left invariant vector fields, where the Lee bracket is essentially the commutator of the vector fields, uh, is dealt off as first of the differential operators. And uh, actually, as the group operation is polynomial, one can show that each uh, invariant vector field is in exponential coordinates a differential operator with polynomial. Efficient. Okay. And now a crucial thing we can do now by using the stratification. So the fact that our Lie algebra is a selected subspace, the first layer, which actually generates the technical iterated commutator of the whole Lie algebra, we fix a basis. Of this first layer. So so we have a system of uh, linearly independent vector fields which span the first layer. And now, one thing that we can do is now essentially use this. Uh, vector fields and composition thereof to actually generate the whole algebra of left invariant operational operators. So for I being a non-commutative multi-index, so effectively I take and two pole of indices which, are, which selects which vector field I'm considering, we define simply x to the i as x uh, i1 i. Okay, so it's just a way of denoting a sort of uh, uh, arbitrary derivative of higher possibly higher order is just the fact that because I mean in, in our D I could just take a multi-index alpha which gives tells me how many derivatives in each direction I want to take but since here yeah, this vector field do not commute I keep track also of the order in which I put the vector fields that's why I use some non-commutative multi-indices but I have uh, another notation here and uh, then by what is known as the Poincare Victor theorem, I know that every left invariant differential operator on the Lie group G is a linear combination of this, uh, this, this derivative is here. Okay, so I wrote it derivatives coming from the space of the first layer because they uh, they generate the full Lie algebra and so by then taking compositions they can put on uh, uh, the environment that Okay, so this is what will play the role of iterated so partial derivatives in our setting. And now finally, here is the sub Laplacian. So, So in this setting for us, the sub Laplacian is just minus the sum squares of these vector fields, which are uh, chosen to be as part of the basis of the first layer. Okay? And this one is a homogeneous second order that environment. Differential 
So, what do I mean by homogeneous? It is the fact that not only is this, of course, sum of squares of first order vector fields, but actually these vector fields come from the first layer. And so this operator behaves well with respect to the automorphic dilations that we defined before. So, for example, if I take the real of a function of a dilated function, I just get it. I make a differentiation with the parameter, which is what you might expect to get for a second order operator. And now associated with the subplaplacian, we have the metric structure, which is what leads us to this subrimanian uh, geometry that was mentioned earlier. So, first of all, let me point out that we can define an inner product which I denote by this subscript and the subplacian on the first layer, uh, which is defined by the fact that this chosen basis of the first layer is not an normal basis. Okay? And of course, this is determined by the basis, but one can check that if you choose any other system of vector fields or basis of which, for which the sum of square gives you the same sub Laplacian, then the inner product will also be the same. The, the inner product is actually determined by the sub Laplacian, not by the choice of the basis. And now, by using this, now we, we are able to introduce the subrimanian metric structure. So, first of all, let me point out that, well, we have uh, this. Uh, subspace of the space of all active variant vector fields, if you evaluate these vector fields at every point, you get at every point the subspace of the tangent space. Okay? So effectively, by many translations, this first layer determines a so-called like invariant distributions, tangent subspaces, that is a subvariant for the horizontal bundle of the tangent bundle given by at every point x of the group just take the span okay and so this of course is a subspace of the time space at the <laughs> so now H, G is the so-called horizontal distribution, which defines part of the sub uh, the subrimanian structures and its elements are horizontal tangent vectors. Okay, so the tangent vector at the point, the group is said to be horizontal if it's in the span of this vector fields evaluated at the base point. And so, in particular, using this notion, we can define 
horizontal. Curve on G is absolutely continuous. Curve gamma value in our group G such that the tangent space and the tangent vector of the curve at every point is horizontal. And then when we have a horizontal curve, we can define the length of horizontal curve. It's just given by the integral of the norm of tangent vector at every point, but now the norm is the computer by using this inner product I can be Okay, because effectively this inner product induces, if you wish, a fiber wise inner product on each of this H of G, and then you use that to compute the norm of the tangent. Okay, so that's the natural notion of the length of the horizontal curve. And then when you have that, you can define the distance. between the point in x, y, and the infinity of the length of the horizontal curves joining x. OK? So that's the notion of, of distance that we are going to, to use here. And now, a priori, if you just take a manifold and at every point you just choose a set of subset of directions, I mean the subspace of the tangent space at every point, and you constrain the curves to move in these directions, it's not a priori obvious that you can join any point with any other point. If you choose your directions badly, you could just choose set of uh, ways, uh, so somehow the directions in such a way that you might perhaps foliate your manifold with some sub-manifolds which are always tangent to these directions, and so you can never leave any of the leaves of the foliation. But here, this is not the case, and the reason is because of the bracket generating condition. Since these vector fields do satisfy the bracket generating condition because the first layer generates the whole the algebra, as we mentioned before, then actually we, there is no sort of uh, uh, sub-manifolds which you can, can, can think of, which are uh, tangent and, and everywhere. So, no foliation, as I mentioned before. And so, this. And so, indeed, what we have is what is called sometimes Charles theorem, or the Chesky Charles theorem which says that actually any pair of points is joined by a horizontal curve and length. And actually, moreover, and this sometimes is called the whole box theorem, or a consequence of the global theorem, actually, this distance induces the Euclidean <coughs> topology. So, actually, this strange distance, at least at the topological level, doesn't do anything different than the Euclidean distance, but as we shall see, <coughs> the distance is not by Lipschitz equivalent to the Euclidean distance, it's topological. Not much more than that. So, actually, in this setting, it's quite easy to see a number of properties of this distance. One, is the left invariance, which effectively can be 
were written by saying that the distance between two points actually can be expressed in terms of the distance of something else from zero. So if you define the distance of x from zero, then you multiply this and the norm of x, then by left invariance of the whole structure, you can just see that the distance of the two points is like a normal difference in, in this non-commutative setting. And this is what sometimes we call the homogeneous norm. And now one has to be careful because in this setup we use the, the word norm, but it's not norm in the sense of vector spaces, uh, the, the standard theory in the sense that, for example, it's not homogeneous when we multiply this in exponential cognitive by a scalar. If the, there is a homogeneity, but it will respect to these automotive relations. So it's not the standard mm -hmm. homogeneity that uh, you would expect. In particular, if step is higher than one, this is not uh, a norm in the sense of theory uh, spaces. Okay? So actually, from these properties, one can see that if x is the composing component, it's one excess as before. Then actually the homogeneous norm of X is just first component, the norm of the first component plus or equivalent to the norm of the first component plus the square root of the norm of the second, etc. etc. plus the S component one over X. And by some homogeneity consideration, it's somehow uh, similar proof as the equivalence of norms. Results in RD. Actually, these kind of objects are metrically equivalent to this. Okay, and so this shows in particular that the uh, when the step S is higher than one, then there is no by Lipschitz equivalence with the standard Euclidean norm, but there is some some order exponents there, not really the by Lipschitz equivalence. Okay. In particular, another thing that one can see from these properties is that if you take the measure of the ball with respect to this distance centered at any point and uh, then radius, this measure is the, the vague measure, the hard measure, will just be expressible in terms of the measure of the ball center zero and radius one. And doesn't really depend on the center because of that invariance. And in terms of the radius, you just have this kind of scale property due to homogeneity. And Q here is what is known as the homogeneous by mesh. Okay. Which, if you wish, is also the transponent that appears. In the Jacobian determinant for the dilations. Okay, so this Q in general when S is bigger than one is strictly larger than the topological dimension. So we have different here from the uh, say this distance and also from this point of view one can see that it's not the same than <laughs> the property says that as the Euclidean distance. Nevertheless, the fact that we have this kind of uh, situation tells us that actually the group G with the subramanian distance and the measure is as a doubling metric measure space, as a space of homogeneous time. And so in particular, a lot of the uh, theory, for example, of singular integrals that has been developed uh, of Mumbai's theory for uh, singular integral space of homogeneous type applies to this setting. And so a number of, uh, so to say, uh, issues and, and tools that one can use, I and mean, indeed the kind of simple compositions and ways to study singular integrals are applicable to, to this setting, despite this not being exactly the same as argument. Okay? And then uh, about, just to go back to the subordination, 
let me just mention another few properties. So, we have Hermandus here. I mean, the sublandation is the sum of squares of this vector field which form a basis of the first layer. For this reason, since the we are in higher steps, so if S is bigger than one, the first layer is not the full tangent space, meaning uh, this, this operator will not be elliptic. Nevertheless, by the Mandel's theorem, there are weaker forms of ellipticity which somehow satisfy this, this operator, in particular, the subtraction. Is accurate. Means that if you is a distribution and omega in G is an open set and uh, the subablation of the distribution restricted to omega is smooth, then the original distribution on the same set. Okay, so this is something which for elliptic operator one could prove, and this is sort of somehow a, a weaker form of ellipticity, actually, uh, a consequence, if you wish, of ellipticity, which is, is, is true also for this operator, which is not elliptic person. Okay, and actually, this is true not only for the sub Laplace, but also for sub Laplace plus first order terms or even zero order terms, which I mean, it has some consequences or smoothness of solutions, certainly pressure equations associated with the sub -ablation. Another important consequence of this hyperlipticity property is the fact uh, that uh, this is sometimes known as a variation of Nelson Stein Springs theorem which tells us that this operator initially defined on the space of simplicity function compact support is essentially self-adjoint. And so actually this means that we can take its closure, the appropriate domain, and this is a self-adjoint operator, positive self-adjoint. So we can actually use uh, apply the spectral theorem to this operator and use it also in particular to define the functional calculus. So, the spectral theorem, you can write. The subplot plasma is the integral of the identity function to the spectral appropriate projection value measure. And then by this representation, we can then define functions of the subplot by just taking the integral of the function f instead of the projection value measure. And this makes sense for any red function. From your infinity to C. And if the function f is bounded, then also the corresponding operator f of n is bounded by 2. The bound is controlled by the supreme norm of the function f. So we have at least on L2 a functional calculus, much the same way as in the case of. Rd with the radial Fourier multiplier, more general Fourier multipliers. So you know that if the 
multiplier f is bounded, then the operator is bounded on a two, and a similar thing we can recover here when using this uh, spectrum. Uh, now, this is true for more general second order, sorry, sorry, for more general second joint operators, but now let's use some of the properties we have discussed so far. So, for example, since L is left invariant, then one can see that any element in the functional calculus is left invariant. Two, and now, if f, for example, is a bounded function, we know f of l is bounded on L2. So we have a bound function, which is a parameter which is bounded on L2. So, in particular, from Schwarz to, to distributions. And so uh, we can write it as a convolution, where again, internal, the convolution can will be in a temporary distribution. And this somehow is one of the analogs of the Fourier transform in the sense that in RD, if you want the function of, uh, so spectral multiplier, uh, sorry, the Fourier multiplier, then it is a convolution operator whose convolution can be the inverse Fourier transform of, of the multiplier. And here, somehow, the, care, the convolution kernel of the function of the Laplacian is this operation, which the, the operation in which we must add to this object. Is some sort of the analog of the Fourier transform to operator functions, at least that we can be using in this in this kind of context. Now, not only do we have left invariance, but we also have homogeneity, which tells us, as I mentioned, that if you differentiate the dilated version of the function, you get this. Uh, Relation with them. First, we differentiate and then relate. And from that, you can get a similar relation for actually the functional calculus. And from this relation, one can find the Then, uh, say, uh, I'll play around so by writing all these operators, convolution operators, and play around with the properties of convolutions using the fact that the dimensions are actually automorphisms, you get a property of this kind. So, somehow, that the convolution can associate with the dilated version of that. Is related to the convolution can specifically left by appropriate dilations. And then, as I mentioned, one of the key uh, properties that we have here is the fact that now we can use the functional calculus to, for example, describe solutions to certain PDEs associated with the uh, subplasian. So For example, you can have the heat equation, and if you write the pushing problem for that, you can write its solution in terms of the heat propagator, so heat of the exponential is the semi group generated by the minus of the so, of course, can be written as a convolution operator like this. So, this is what we need to call the heat kernel. And on the other hand, for example, if we have the wave equation, Uh, 
then the function of calculus representing the solution of this question problem. And again, you have these functions of the subroutations that are here. And this is what we know that we want to And of course, as I mentioned, in the case of RD, a number of tools, including Fourier analysis, can be used in order to understand better properties or even explicit formula for some of these objects. And so, suddenly, we like the properties of these 3Ds. Actually, in this setting, one might try and also do the reverse, in the sense that there are PV techniques that allow one to actually obtain good estimates or information on these objects, like the wave propagator, the heat cam, and good heat cannon estimates of things like that, and then going somehow reverse. This allows one then to get additional information on more general functions of, of this ablation appropriate uh, composition of sort of relation techniques. And what I'd like to do in the next lectures is to tell you some ideas on how this has been done and what are the problems and open problems that we have. Maybe you have some time for some short questions. Yeah. Maybe it would be good to give some examples of stratified groups. Yes, I mean, uh, one uh, uh, example, the trivial one, which I mentioned before, is RD in the sense that when you take S equals one, so the step one situation, then the whole sit uh, the situation here is, is, uh, is a billion, this homogeneous one, which is the norm, and so on. You're just working in RD with the standard operation. So, the left translation of just the standard of the translations. Uh, in uh, uh, the case of more general, uh, so non commutative groups, of course, probably the most known classical example of this setup is the Heisenberg group. And uh, in this case, I mean, I will discuss this at length in the next lectures for sure. I mean, uh, just to write it down quickly. As this kind of, of operation, and in this case, this would be the first layer, somehow, this is the second layer, so it's a two step uh, stratified group. And by using the basis, the left environmental fits coming from these directions, so you can form the first and the second directions. But the point is that the Heisenberg group, in a sense, is the simplest possible example of this kind of structure. and it's only, if you wish, two step. The, uh, the two step, the, the second sort of layer part is just one dimensional. And so, in some sense, it's uh, perhaps one of the easiest examples one can actually study in, in this setting. And on the other hand, one can create more general variants of this, which are much, uh, much more complicated with higher dimension of the second layer, even, of course. Uh, higher step structures as well. Thank you. Um, okay. Everything here is the uh, left invariant, right? Yes. That, that's a choice. Yes. It be right invariant. That's right. That's right. Is it more common to use left invariant? I guess it's relatively traditional, but I mean, uh, <laughs> again, I think if we look up uh, the literature, maybe especially in early stages, you also find it for which like private type situation, but essentially that's what one can do here. As, as you see in this case, luckily enough, the, 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 the R measure is both left and right. So in this case, it doesn't change much uh, to, to, to go from one to the other. I mean, but, but you have to choose one, otherwise then things get a bit confused. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
and they can thank you as in the lecture, and we meet back in half an hour in the break. <laughs> Thank you.